Welcome to Saskatoon's Wildlife, the real nightlife in Saskatoon, where Saskatoon's trail cameras reveal who's who. A part of National Forest Week, our forests continually giving. We would like to acknowledge that the afforestation areas are situated in the West Swale U.S. Island Glacial Spillway, a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Nihiawak, Cree, Nakawi, Satu, and the Yankton and Yankatoni Nakoda people. We all have relationships with the land, standing peoples, forests and waters teach us to honor and respect the past and, and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find inspiration and guidance from histories, languages and cultures which broaden our understanding and community collaboration for the present and the future. To introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Ryan Brooks is a member of the Indigenous Land Management Institute in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources. Brooke combines traditional knowledge, wildlife ecology, ecosystem monitoring science, and a wealth of data about wildlife movement and activities in Saskatoon. Thank you. Dr. Brooke? Good job. Got it. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much for the invite. I'm really excited to have a chance to uh, talk to you guys tonight about some research. And I, I, I want to first mention, uh, just one second, I'll be right back. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so I want to first acknowledge my graduate student, Katie Harris, who's uh, doing a lot of the work to get this set up. And it's only uh, been almost exactly one year since we got this project off the ground. We had grand notions of starting earlier, but uh, COVID put a wrench into all research. I think everybody's research, including our own, even here in, in and around the city of Saskatoon. Um, and so the idea came from a number of years ago. We've been talking about wildlife and there's been a lot of interesting things going on with wildlife around the province, but there hasn't been a lot of research on wildlife inside the city of Saskatoon in these urban areas. And particularly interesting is there hasn't been any real long-term information. So we've had a lot of questions about where are deer and how do wildlife respond to traffic and many, many questions across the board, but no data to answer that. So working with me, Wasson, and a whole bunch of other groups, uh, in, including um, uh, the, the Nature Festival and others, we came together and we were sort of scratching our head whether we we're going to have any money to pay for it. And very kindly, the zoo uh, bought us a whole bunch of trail cameras for our research. And this uh, Katie Harris got a really nice scholarship from NSERC. And so we don't actually have any direct grants for this project, but it got off the ground nonetheless, thanks to uh, some good support there. And so the idea was to set up a network of trail cameras in and around the city of Saskatoon and look at what we often call this urban rural gradient. So in this photo here, obviously we're into, we're, we're in the city limits, but we're quite close to the city, but these are obviously ag lands here. And so starting from ag lands on the periphery of the city and then working our way in up until we're, you know, into the downtown essentially. And so we wanted to set up this network of cameras and the idea is now we've got a year of data but to continue that over the long term, ideally decades. And that's really where we start to see uh, trends and patterns, but also maybe see changes over time as well. And I will also say that we're part of this UWIN network, which is this great network of cities around North America that also do the same kinds of research in cities. And so we all meet regularly and share data and uh, ask a lot of the same kinds of questions. And so with this UN, we, you know, there's cities in, for example, uh, Regina just got started working on this. Uh, Edmonton has been at it for a while and there's city all, cities all around the U.S. So we can actually look at bigger picture beyond just in the city of Saskatoon. So there's a couple of couple of objectives here for this program. And these are some of our very early uh, uh, cameras that were started coming in. So that's September 15th of last year. So we really are... Uh, in the very, very early days of, of the research. And um, this first year has been really enlightening for us in all sorts of ways and collecting many, many thousands of photos of, of a whole range of mammals 
uh, some of which were more surprising than others, and some were fairly predictable. But of course, the, uh, we're also interested in this urban-rural gradient, and that also ties into green space as well, and some of the forested areas that we have. And of course, we know that trees are very, very important to wildlife, and so we were interested in this uh, connection between wildlife and forest and, and human activity. And so we've been able to document uh, deer coming to our cameras, uh, skunk, we've got a whole range of, of mammals coming in. We do collect data on birds, uh, but we're not analyzing that right now. Um, we are interested in, of course, the habitat around those, and we're doing habitat data collection as well. Um, we also get a tremendous number of various kinds of rabbits and of course some dogs and cats and numerous people walking, hiking and running and variously traveling through the city as well. And so just to sort of explain briefly what the plan was, if you see all these uh, black dots there, that Miwasan already had some trail cameras primarily focused on the swale area. Um, and then there were also a few that we've been working with one escape to put out four cameras and so we've had that out for a while as well. But that was really it for the city. And so what we wanted to do is look at these different kinds of areas. So the gray is the built area, of course, the, the blue is the aquatic system. And of course the river is very prominent through right through the city. But also we do have grassland systems. There is quite a little bit of agricultural land as you can see in yellow, especially around the university. Um, and then of course it's designated green space. And we've got a wonderful network of parks and corridors there, which we suspect because of, uh, and you can really see some good examples here. And of course the river is certainly probably the best example, but where uh, green spaces connect the landscape and at least potentially provide habitat corridors for animals to move through. So that's sort of where we were and so we decided to put out uh, three dozen cameras to start and that's when we decided to stratify it and of course spread it uh, using what we call this design from UN. And we've actually set, uh, so one transect that runs north-south across the city and one that runs east-west and the, the protocol is to try and generate random one kilometer buffers around these points and then you can put the camera anywhere within those circles <laughs> and so these are all the new cameras that we've proposed to put out and we put put them into the built environment aquatic all those different habitats to reflect uh, <coughs> pardon me different kinds of habitat and represent the very edge of the city and then of course there's some right, right smack in the middle of the city and this is ultimately where we ended up putting them all. And so we've got a nice spread around the city. Certainly one of the things that we would love to do is get funding to increase our sample size. We have had a number of uh, vandalism cases where cameras have been destroyed and we've actually had seven cameras now that have been stolen. Um, and that's been really unfortunate. So we've had to really think a lot about how we can minimize those losses because not only are they expensive to have to replace a camera and a card and batteries and all that but of course all the data gets lost along the way and so we have a, a bunch of red sites in these rural areas uh, green what we call peri-urban and then of course yellow which is truly urban environment so we have samples within all three of these different habitat types so we can compare and contrast across and look at forest cover and what we call fragmentation how, how broken up or how connected the landscape is and so we've done a lot of work putting out the trail cameras uh, and yeah finally after much we, we finally got our cameras and our student and our project and everything planned and then, um, then we then COVID put us on hold for the summer. So as I say, it was only just uh, in September of last year when we finally got the green light to get them all out. And and a lot of private landowners, I will say, were very supportive, and we had overall very strong and, and positive support for these trail cameras. So that's been great. Um, and so certainly collecting lots of different wildlife species. Um, moose we've actually had a couple of moose on the landscape this is not from within the city i'm just showing some other examples of of things that we're interested in but uh, another part of my day job is studying these invasive wild pigs and so we're really interested in what else might show up in the city for example wild pigs we shouldn't be surprised at all if uh, if we do end up with some wild pigs coming into the city and it, and perhaps even uh, cougar um, some of these other rare species and I'll, I'll show you one other surprise that we got uh, along the way in a bit. And so yeah, that's been, uh, that's one of these great things about trail cameras is you're, you're never really entirely sure what, uh, what you're going to get on them and every time is a bit of a surprise. Let's see if I can... 
that there we go um, and you know really good quality images sometimes you get multiple species uh, my group has worked on a program that can actually automatically identify species in here but so far uh, Katie is doing it all by hand and I won't uh, I won't take up a lot of time with data but I did want to show you some of the analysis that Katie's been working on and specifically one area she's particularly interested in is the relative distribution of coyotes and foxes because there's this sort of rule in ecology that's often said that two species cannot occupy the same niche. And so uh, within that city, we think that probably, the, or at least we predicted that foxes would be more urban and more central and coyotes would be more peripheral. Uh, but actually what we see is that uh, occurrences of, of um, coyotes vary across different habitats. And we see a bunch of them <laughs> showing up in all. <clears throat> There's this a better view of the world here where we see uh, uh, coyote is gray and red fox is orange and you can see uh, quite a difference there. And of course, as predicted, a lot of those sites more into the downtown, although certainly those ones right along the University of Saskatchewan and in that area have uh, both a mix. And so we're seeing a lot of mixed results. This is, of course, only based on a, a year of data. So we'll see once we get more years and see more variation. but. This is quite an interesting dynamic. And this is just one sort of, I think, interesting example of the, the kinds of uh, factors that this urban rural gradient can play. And also the fact that animals are adapting a lot and coyotes and certainly are doing thriving in many cities in, in, um, in Canada, for example, I know Calgary has done a tremendous amount of work on urban coyotes. And there are certainly a number of issues of concern around that. And uh, the coyotes are one example of a species that aren't necessarily that everybody loves to see. Uh, deer are another one in terms of potential collisions. And we do have a number of deer collisions every year in and around the city as well. And so that's certainly part of this research as well is to identify that, you know, some of those species that are relatively benign, like foxes that most people don't worry too much about and are happy to see, but maybe coyotes and, uh, and moose are better examples of things that people don't always want to have. Um, and then certainly deer has figured very prominently and we've had a lot of people approach us as we proceeded through this year reporting seeing a lot of deer, um, white tail and mule deer of course in the city and, and raising those concerns about con uh, conflicts, uh, particularly con um, um, con uh, contacts with vehicles. And of course, I, many of you saw there, there was a big discussion about reducing limits on some of these streets specifically or in part because of deer collisions. Um, and that was turned down by the city. So we, we still have, and of course we know that speed is one of the major factors that influences uh, deer and vehicle collisions. And when people slow down, it definitely prevents injuries and, and losses and, and indeed in some cases deaths from collisions with, uh, with deer and moose and, and the other big animals. This is probably one of our bigger surprises. Uh, so just west of the city, uh, only about a kilometer, probably about just 1.2 kilometers west of the Walmart on the west side of the city, we had a black bear show up. That was quite interesting. We searched the records and there's one case of a black bear showing up in the city previously. And that's the only thing we've heard of. And so that was a bit of a surprise. And thankfully it didn't actually come into the city proper. Um, and this was on a little patch of bush very close to the edge, but we monitored those sites and checked regularly and the, the bear stayed around for a short bit and then left, but certainly highlights those kind of some amazing surprises that you can get. And this particular bear you can see is actually found a, an aspen tree or, or possibly knocked it over itself and his feet. I've seen them numerous times, black bears feeding on those leaves uh, and they just grab them and just pull the branch through their mouth and just strip off all the leaves and eat aspen leaves in large volumes. Uh, moose was one of the other, uh, not so much surprises. We were certainly well aware that moose were coming in, but how many we've seen uh, spread around the city. And maybe some of you saw the video, of, it was about, about October of last year, I think it was, where a moose was actually running down Broadway. Uh, we did not get that one particularly in our camera, but we've had several. And certainly again, um, this is one of those more controversial species that many would argue do not belong in the city. We definitely see quite a number of them. We have several in our, of course, urban areas right along the edge. That's some excellent habitat. And we know that they're very strongly associated with wetlands. 
forest cover and agricultural crops. And moose do feed extensively on canola. Uh, Oilseed crops are really, really strong attraction for wool, uh, for uh, for moose, and they'll feed feed intensively, especially on canola. They love to go in July, and they just pick those yellow blossoms with their lips and just strip them all off. And of course, into fall when it when it starts to turn to seed. Flax as well, so uh, some of the other oil seeds can play a role there too. And, um, definitely an attractant, and that will be something we'll need to keep following up on and looking at because that that is a point of major concern. I live in Lakeview, and we've had a number of moose go through. And one of my neighbors had a moose come through the gate and ended up in the backyard and panicked and just took out the entire north fence of his yard in order to get out and uh, they can be destructive and dangerous. And so that's just a, a very short overview. I wanted to hopefully spend a little more time answering questions and talking about the research rather than uh, getting too much into the data per se. But before I do open it up to uh, any more questions or discussion, I really want to thank uh, the University of Saskatchewan who supported this. Uh, Mia Wasson has been a tremendous partner, Wild About Saskatoon. Uh, actually, what started us, our connection with the UN was uh, three summers ago, they, uh, Wild About Saskatoon invited someone from the UN to come up and talk about the program up here. And that was really what kick-started the thought and talking about it. And of course, as I said, Forestry Farm, Park and Zoo um, very kindly donated uh, not only cameras, but the metal protective cases, the cable locks, which are critical, as well as uh, the memory cards that go in there. And so a lot of, uh, and the city has been a great partner in terms of uh, helping us find sites and, and working with us. Katie's funded through a grant through the the NSERC program and, and the UN uh, has been a great network to be part of and certainly help us. Uh, I was born and raised on a farm in rural areas and only fairly recently have moved to become a full-time, I guess, city guy, or at least only recently acknowledged that I'm a city guy. But uh, learning about urban wildlife research is, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but there's some pretty interesting and exciting differences that go on uh, once you get into cities as well. So I will pause there and uh, be more than happy to take questions or comments and, and certainly note that once that we get past this damn COVID business, we are uh, we're quite keen to uh, have people come out with us and participate and, you know, people volunteer when we go to download cameras and lots of opportunities, especially for schools. If you know any teachers that are interested in being involved this winter, uh, do please let us know because that's one thing that we can do with COVID is do online stuff, uh, working with a lot of these uh, different cameras. So with that, I will say thank you for now. And uh, I see one question in the chat here. Is it healthy for them to eat? Uh, yeah, generally speaking, the crops, I mean, for the most part, yeah, when moose are feeding on agricultural crops, it's perfectly fine. And there's a tremendous amount of, uh, one of the things that moose need and they often get from wetlands is uh, some of the fatty acids and so actually they get those from the crops and so yeah that they, they wouldn't hopefully are not feeding on them right when you know pesticides are being applied but uh, typically moose are gonna when there's any human activity we know this we actually did a, a collaring study of moose between saskatoon and regina about five six years ago and uh, we you found that you know as soon as there's any human activity whether it's a swath or a spray or anything those moose get pushed off into a different field and then they'll come back a few days later so so no concern there. Um, uh, that is all I see on the chat. If people want to unmute themselves and ask the question, I'd be more than happy to take or feel free to, uh, to just type one in. Is there a contact for you in case classes or teachers want to get involved with your program? Yes, absolutely. I will go back start and there's our uh, that's my phone number and email right at the bottom yeah so feel free to reach out to me by email thank you you should talking. also note that we have a, a a wildlife in the city uh facebook page as well so feel free to join that and we're posting photos and and updates and things on that and so it's uh i'm trying to remember now bear with me i'll have to search that out but in the uh we do um we do have a facebook page as well which I'll, I'll i'll point to the link to right away cool any other questions 
Um, I, I know from listening to you talk before that the wild boars have been sighted in the RMF Carmen Park. Do you know if any have been sighted in the city so far or not yet, really? None in the city yet that we know of, thankfully, um, but certainly very, very close, absolutely. Yeah, the RMF Corman Park has been, I mean, up until, I'm not sure if they have anybody recently, but I know um, not that long ago, there was somebody who was, you know, a large part of their job was actually finding and removing pigs from the RMF Corman Park. So definitely, um, definitely a concern. And certainly what we know about wild pigs is they do extremely well in urban environments. Um, yeah, so definitely a, a point of concern. And I, I would probably, my feeling would be that um, we're probably not so much an if we're going to get w uh, wild pigs coming in, but when. So have there been areas of wetlands that have been destroyed or are, are they usually rousted out before they do a lot of damage? Oh no, they've done tremendous damage. Oh, no question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are lots of cases and, and um, we have a lot of documented cases where wetlands have been really hit very hard. There's been a surfeit of rabbits in the city for the last few years. So I'm assuming that's uh, what the coyotes and foxes are mainly thing. Do they do anything into pets or any other interactions with humans that are problematic? Well, coyotes can, can potentially uh, harm pets. Yes, they will gladly feed on cats and, and smaller dogs. So that can be a real risk for sure. And so obviously, if you're keeping your cats and dogs in your yard or in your house, then it's perfectly fine. It's the free ranging ones that get in trouble. And we do see not so much dogs, but definitely we have cats that come out <coughs> wandering in front of our cameras at all hours, for sure. So it definitely is a concern there. And, and it, you know, there's certainly, um, while coyotes are not a huge human risk, I don't know if you've seen in the news recently, but Stanley Park in Vancouver has had a real problem. And of course, where the problem starts, uh, unfortunately also is that People feed them and bait them, and then they become really used to humans. And so they're, they have to, right now, they're going into Stanley Park and uh, having to remove a whole bunch of coyotes because they've been so uh, human conditioned. So they can be a problem, and certainly there are a, a rare but definite cases of them attacking children and that sort of thing. And so <coughs> definitely need to be aware of that. And I also will say, if you're if you're interested in looking at our our, uh, our uh, Facebook page, it's YXE Wildlife is uh, the term that you search. Y YXE Wildlife is our uh, our Facebook page. So feel free to follow along there, and we'll see some. Uh, we're about. I've been, as I said, I've been off for a little bit there, but we've posted a bunch of photos and images. Um, some, some, there was a Saskatoon or uh, some of the news picked up on that black bear sighting, which was kind of interesting and, and a lot of nice uh, photos that, that we've collected that we, we try and keep updated pretty regularly. We, if you want to follow me on Twitter as well, I'm just at, uh, Ryan K. Brook, B-R-O-O-K. And, uh, you can follow me there and we post pretty regularly on, on those photos as well. So with the black bear sighting, do you think he was just displaced because of the northern forest fires? That's a great question, actually. Um, that could have been, definitely. That's a great question. Um, fires definitely do displace wildlife quite a lot. The, um, the other thing, though, is, of course, uh, younger males tend to go wandering a lot as well. And so usually, you know, in their second and third year, young males will start to wander around looking for looking for love in all the wrong places, as they say. And so um, it could be young males dispersing, but uh, that is fairly far from where we'd expect them. You know, normally the overwhelming majority of black bears are closer to the forest fringe. But having said that, that's it's not all that surprising either. Black bears can move a tremendous amount of uh, 
of distance over a short period and and yeah we haven't seen that bear since so so it's hard to say for sure but yeah probably fire played a role So you did some really exciting presentations about what's happening around Saskatoon. Did you want to mention what you were doing up in the Arctic a little bit? Touch on it? Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, so we have, uh, I've been going up to the Arctic since uh, 1994, I guess, was when I first went up there. And so I work along the Hudson Bay Coast, out of Churchill, but in a area called the Wapask National Park. And so we have long-term monitoring of caribou. And we've also, we put out 80 new trail cameras uh, out in along the Hudson Bay coast to study caribou and wolves as well. So that's something that we, we've had some trail cameras out there, but we've just enhanced it dramatically. And so much more and a much better uh, spatial distribution of cameras. So we're going to have, this time next year, we're going to have a, hopefully a lot of wolf and caribou photos to look through and, and make sense out of. And we also flew a caribou survey as well. And I do a lot of habitat work. So I measure permafrost and vegetation, which is of course important habitat for polar bear dens, which uh, we, we were looking at some polar bear dens and we we're trying to figure out the risk of uh, fire actually, because we were when we were going to some of these polar bear den sites, we actually found some extensive burned areas and fire is going to be a big risk because polar bears will den into these big, huge piles of peat moss that are in the in the tundra sites, which is great, but they always tunnel underneath a tree and the roots of, and all the vegetation hold that all together so they can tunnel under it. But after a fire goes through, if they try, we've seen cases where bears try and tunnel in and just collapses. So fire is a big risk, as is permafrost uh, collapse as well. So those are some things that we've been working on for a long, long time. Since 1994 then, would you have witnessed uh effects of climate change and yeah we have for sure probably the, certainly the most obvious uh, and and really noticeable thing is how much it's dry to the point now where we've actually changed uh, footwear so a lot of the areas we used to when i first started going up in their 90s we used to wear hip waders and now we just put on rubber boots there's just so much less water like you know half a foot or more of less water in a lot of these sites so not just a small amount, but some areas where you had to be actually, you had to be really careful that you didn't, you could risk getting stuck there. Uh, and now we just walk through with, uh, you know, not quite knee high rubber boots and just power through no problems. So that drying has been there. And we've also seen a lot more fire. Fire is increasing in how much area burns, but also the intensity of which it burns. It burns a lot hard, hotter and harder now. We're just getting hot temperatures. And what's interesting that we found from all of our camera data from, from caribou is that um, they form these huge groups in summer when the bugs are bad. And so from minus three all the way to plus 19, the biggest group you'll ever see of caribou is 13. But as soon as the temperature is 20 Celsius and above, group size goes up to a thousand or more. Up to I have a photo of you know, well over 3000 caribou in one big group. And so with climate change, we're going to see more of those hot days and more bigger groups, which means that they're harassed by insects. And when those big groups, that gives them some relief from insects, but it also sets them up to spend a lot more time and energy moving around and less time feeding. So there is that does translate into harm to caribou. And so, um, you know, we do have long term concerns about their sustainability for sure. Now, perhaps at that area uh, around where you are on the Hudson Bay coast, you're not seeing the starvation of the polar bears, like what they're predicting if the glacier ice uh, melts in the Arctic Circle. Are you seeing any effects of that on the polar bear population or are you mainly looking at the caribou and the wolf population? No, well, it's interesting you said that. We saw, I mean, polar bears do get old and die, but this year when we were flying our caribou survey, we saw two polar bears. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. They were just, you know, some of these big males could be 1,200 pounds. And so one that was probably well over a thousand pounds is probably less than half that. And you could just see it lying there. It couldn't even get up and move when we flew over it. And it just, it was just hanging rolls of skin hanging off it. It was just terrible to see, but you know, that does happen as animals get older, but it is definitely a point of concern. And that is, as you say, that's exactly what we predict from climate change. So 
the concern is that um, it, Hudson Bay just takes longer and longer to freeze every year. And that's really where they get all their food is the polar bears go out on the sea ice and they feed on seals. And they come off when Hudson Bay melts. And when I first went up there in 94, I was telling them that when I bicycled into town for Canada Day, I had to carry my bike over a big snow drift. Well, I haven't seen snow in July 1 in probably at least 15 or 20 years. And so we're seeing a longer uh, onshore season for bears. And so, yeah, we're definitely seeing thinner animals and, and not seeing them in as good a condition as we'd like. Is there anything that human intervention can do? Like sometimes humans put up bird feeders and then birds get reliant on them. Is there anything that can be done for other kind of wildlife in that kind of way? Well, the major thing is that we, if we can address climate change, that would be, that's really the long-term and arguably only uh, real solution toward this. Is there, there's some Band-Aid fixes perhaps, and people have talked about feeding bears and trying to move bears further north and these sorts of things. And some of that might be slightly helpful, but at the end of the day, 99% of the problem is, is global climate change. And we collectively have a major role to play in that. And so if we could address that, that could actually save our polar bears. Because right now, the prediction is that, you know, probably not during my lifetime, but certainly during my son and daughter's lifetime, Hudson Bay will be completely ice-free year-round. And of course, that means the end. Of, there's no chance for polar bears to survive without sea ice. So their long-term prospects, or, or even medium-term prospects, are not great. Thank you. That's very scary, but very enlightening at the same time. Would there be any sort of the major thrust of what people could do towards climate action that you can think of? Like, I know there's a plethora, but... Yeah, well, there's certainly a long shopping list for sure, but any way that we can reduce our, our carbon footprint by turn, turn the thermostat down a bit and wear a sweater in the winter, um, you know, ride your bike instead of driving everywhere, don't idle your vehicle. Um, you know, finding uh, efficient appliances for the home, insulating your seal, the roof in your house can play a huge role in reducing your carbon footprint. So yes, there are many websites that provide lots of tips on that, but that just scratches the surface. You know, everything from recycling to, to sort of, yeah, not, not idle, idling your car as long. There's a lot of options out there that could be very effective. Thanks. And, and you said you were working with a student named Katie, um, and she was um, focusing at the beginning about uh, mainly the coyote and the fox population. Is it kind of? Uh, and you said that you were thinking that they would be in different areas of, of Saskatoon, and now you're finding that the coyotes can kind of go anywhere in the different environments. Are you finding the same with the fox? And are you mainly seeing the red fox? And are you seeing any of that rare species called the swift fox? No swift foxes, unfortunately, no. That's, this is not, they're really a prairie species. So little hope of seeing them, unfortunately, but, uh, but we are seeing both species. And I think before we say too much, I'd like to see two or three years of data. But I think what we have seen generally is that there, there are more coyotes along the periphery and more foxes towards the center overall as predicted, but that it's more complex than that. And that we shouldn't really be too surprised because we do know that animals have adapted tremendously and coyotes are a great example of what, I mean, historically, you know, 50 years ago, I think we would have really thought as only an, a rural species. And certainly I think a lot of people would be surprised to somebody suggested they would be an urban species, but they've really done a tremendous job of adapting. And, you know, I know someone in Saskatoon has a coyote that uh, dens under their backyard shed and has pups almost every year and so they've they've really adapted exceedingly well to that then you know that really speaks to the need for multiple years of data indeed hopefully we'll get to the point where we have decades of data and then we can answer a lot of these questions better with only a year i think we have to be pretty cautious but some interesting insights nonetheless in terms of how how both species seem to be using it. and indeed the exact there's quite a number of trail cameras where we have seen both coyote and fox, even though theoretically they should be avoiding each other. What about Great. raccoons? We have seen only uh, a small number of raccoons so far. 
Um, and that, again, speaks probably as much as anything to the need that in an ideal world, we'd love to get, you know, probably 30 or 40 more cameras to increase our sample size. But we have seen some. We have not looked at the, any of the details of it yet in terms of analysis. But we do have a, this winter, we're going to be digging in deep and doing a lot of deep dive into the data and sort of looking and seeing what's, uh, what, what some of those overall trends are. So when you briefly introduced us to the data, you mainly focused on the mammals that are walking past the trail cameras. Are you seeing any um, birds or hawks or gulls or grouse or anything like that? We, we Yeah, we are definitely seeing birds for sure. Um, I think we've probably seen a few bats swing by as well. Um, we actually had a hoary bat uh, with two young land in our yard uh, just before I went up north. That was quite an exciting afternoon. Uh, but in terms of birds, we, um, we are collecting those data, but we haven't analyzed anything yet. Just simply because we only, it is really only the two of us effectively doing it, all the data collection and analysis. And so um, that's, that's it for now, but absolutely uh, it would be great down the road to find a student who is a keen bird person because there's a lot of good data there as well. And we have seen a number of birds. I have, I will say though, in another study, we did have a problem with, um, Pileated woodpeckers coming in and smashing. There's a, a plastic cover over the sensor that senses a, it's motion activated. So if the thing goes by, it takes a photo, right? And 24 7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, anything walks by, it takes a picture. But pileated woodpeckers smashed in the plastic cover. So they can be, uh, can be nasty that way. That's interesting. I think that you made an interesting comment that the coyotes adapted well to living in the city and there was the kid of uh, the den of coyotes that actually had pups. Uh, I thought that the person that let them be under their shed also adapted to the coyotes well. So I don't know too many people that are that friendly towards coyotes. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. There is an adaptation of people and uh... And just learning too. I know we've done a, I've done a lot of talking here in Lakeview where I live about most of the people and sort of hopefully at least not being so surprised when we see a moose come down the street and knowing what to do about it. And same with coyotes and other things is being sort of aware of, you know, what are the real risks for these things. And, and certainly whether it's a black bear or moose, to definitely call that into 911 and let them know because those those animals, without question, moose and, and, and bear have no place, you know, becoming established in the city and they need to be moved out immediately just because of a, a high risk to uh, personal safety. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Just unmute yourself and feel free to um, ask if you have anything you'd like to find out. Uh, someone says, thank you for saying that, not just sugarcoating. I'm not sure what that uh, response was, but <laughs> uh, some people have said I have no filter. I'm going to, one of the things that I, uh, one of the promises I made when I started at the University of Saskatchewan in 2010 was that I was going to uh, for, for whatever it be worth or not, I was going to give 100% honest answers 100% of the time. And so uh, <laughs> it's not always what some folks in government and others want to hear, but uh, I'm all about telling the truth. And I, I will say that that is one of the great honors of working at the university and having academic freedom is the ability to say those kinds of things and, and whether they're popular or not, say them over and over. And if uh, and still be able to not worry about losing my job for, for saying them, but that is a, a true honor for sure. And, and indeed, arguably a, a major responsibility as well, because many of my colleagues uh, could easily get fired from, you know, other, other jobs in government or other, they could be fired pretty quickly for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Right. Well, I think that comment was to do on the climate issues and, and the way you addressed that question. And, and uh, yes, you did a, a very uh, good job about talking about climate action. So that was cool. Good. Yes. So it kind of looks like nobody's got a question coming forward at the moment. We can give people a few more times. Maybe it takes time to find the unmute button on their phone or type it in. 
Many are probably in their pajamas and don't want to turn their camera on. <laughs> right? Never know. <laughs> it's almost that time for me. I uh, Usually it takes me about a week to recover after going up north for so long and long days in the field because of course the days are quite long up there and uh, and we do a lot of flying around by helicopter and I don't know why it is but I come back and I'm usually pretty exhausted for a few days. That's for sure. It's a different uh, different way of getting your biorhythms used to things all right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say thanks so much for the invite to talk to you all tonight about our research. And as I say, if uh, if you know any teachers, please spread the good word. If, uh, if any of you are interested in coming out with us one day, it, I don't know when that'll be. We keep thinking, I keep, we've been using the word soon for a long time because there's been a number of students and teachers and stuff who are keen to to get out with us, but uh, st we're unfortunately still under COVID restrictions. And so it's just been Katie and I, but uh, at some point in the near future, hopefully next summer, we're gonna have to be real busy with people tagging along to see the, the research. It's quite fun. And um, I was explaining to my friends up in the Arctic that like we were to do the trail camera work up in Churchill and along the Hudson Bay coast is about maybe just over $14,000 a day when you have a helicopter and all that. But when you work in Saskatoon, I think I've spent $63 in gas and uh, and uh, Tim Hortons and one Slurpee when I was driving around Saskatoon. So it's the research is much, much more cost efficient and, and quite more enjoyable when you get to drive around in your vehicle and get some, get some Timmy Hortons along the way too. Have you ever been to the A-Force Station areas? I have not yet. I would love to go. Absolutely. I was just, uh, as we were having the discussion about this, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember how long ago that was, a couple of months ago maybe, I was putting that on my to-do list that now that I'm, and this year got held up so much. Normally I'm back by the end of August, or even third week of August, but this year all the helicopters got pulled away to fight forest fires. And so that was why we were so delayed. But uh, now that I'm back, definitely my dog and I would love to check out some of those sites. Very cool. Uh, Richard saying for our Baker Out Forest Stationery is the larger one, but it's also right now getting the larger human footprint. George Jennery Park still has a really low human footprint, so uh, the likelihood of seeing wild animals just from a walk is, is much more higher. So it's kind of exciting still. That's fantastic. It is, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Again, I appreciate okay. the discussion and lots of great questions and uh, always fun to talk about wildlife. Never get tired. Yeah, I want to thank you for your time tonight. You were just awesome. We've got a note or a question in the chat box. If we um, wrote down everybody that signed up for this event, um, could we make a list and send it off to you that, that they could be notified when it's time to like go out and check trail, trail cameras or be involved somehow? Yes, that would be wonderful. I just typed in my email again in case people didn't get it. But yeah, feel free to fire me a note. and. Hopefully that will be sooner than later, and hopefully it's not exactly when it turns minus 45. We may right. not have as many takers at minus 45 as we did, uh, what was it today, 26 or something? It was amazing. It was. It was very beautiful out. Okay, you guys have a great night and, and hope to see you again soon. Yeah, have a good one. Thanks everybody for coming. Have a good evening. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Remember, we have more events coming up every night, and please tell others. Thank you to Dr. Ryan Brook, and thank you for joining us. Dr. Ryan Brook has access to Saskatoon's real nightlife, his wildlife, ecology, and community engagement, WECE lab at the University of Saskatchewan, uses 30 trail cameras. Our goal tonight is to promote discussion about trees and forests and their multiple and essential benefits. The health of trees is being affected by climate change, but trees are also a necessary solution in mitigating it. We aim to raise awareness about what trees and forests give us and what we need to do in return to protect and enhance trees and forests. Thank you from the friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Areas, Inc. Please join us at the 326-acre Richard St. Barbaker Afforestation Area 
and at the 148-acre George Jennery Urban Regional Park. Who knows what kind of wildlife you will see when you are out on a walk. It's truly exciting to have a man-made forest on the prairies. Join us for our other National Forest Week events posted on YouTube and we will be having a 50th anniversary celebration on November the 6th at 1 o'clock. Thank you.